welcome back, and, and thank you uh, to all the organizers for putting together this uh, congress. I enjoyed myself so far. This has been great. I uh, really learned a lot from this morning talks. So um, try to continue uh, with, with some new uh, content for you here this afternoon. So. Over the past 10 years or so, there's been a lot of progress in DNA sequencing technologies. Um, so we can now sequence genomes uh, for, for relatively cheap. And this has ushered in a whole new uh, era of phylogenetics, what we call the phylogenomic era. And so we've been doing uh, phylogenomic analyses of Octorinca for about seven years now. So I thought I would try to kind of summarize what's been done so far. Um, highlights some of the gaps in what's been uh, accomplished for Akinrika in phylogenomics, and talk about what we've learned that we didn't already you know from previous previous studies. So basically, I want to summarize the recent phylogenomic studies. These include studies of the major lineages of Akinrika. More detailed studies within some subfamilies of cicadality that we've done in our lab. Um, some more on tree hoppers, also a few studies that are focused on vulgarmorpha as well as cicadamorpha. I'll then try to summarize what we've learned from all this and um, give some conclusions for future uh, ideas for future research. So what do we mean by phylogenomics and how does it differ from phylogenetics? Well, traditionally phylogenetic analyses use morphology or a small number of genes, uh, sequence data from a few genes. Phylogenomics, in contrast, uses data from throughout the genome uh, and lots and lots of data. So, so that's a it's a difference in you know at least an order order of two or magnitude in terms of the number of characters that are incorporated, and these characters can come from whole genome sequencing, which is still kind of expensive, so it's not used that much yet, especially for groups like Akinorinka, which have relatively large genomes. Um, but a lot of work that's been done on this group so far has been based on transcriptomics, which is basically where you sequence the transcribed part of the genome, which is the messenger RNA. And that basically just gives you the, pro the exon sequences from the protein coding genes. And so it cuts out a lot of the additional genome, genome uh, information that's not transcribed. So there's also some additional genome uh, reduction methods, including, oops, including uh, methods like anchor type enrichment and ultra conserved elements, which basically use uh, DNA probes, DNA hybridization probes, to capture particular regions of the genome, particular loci, and in most cases, um, particular protein coding genes that are thought to be informative of phylogenetic relationships. And um, so these, these can be accomplished with dried specimens as well as ethanol preserved material. So these are much more versatile versatile for uh, large-scale phylogenomics. Um, transcriptomics, the main uh, constraint is that you need fresh material or material that's been uh, preserved in a special buffer called RNA later that actually preserves the messenger RNA, because the RNA tends to degrade uh, much more quickly, quickly than DNA. So um, I'm not including in this definition of uh, phylogenomics, uh, phylogenetic analyses based on whole mitochondrial genomes, and that's because most of the work that's been done with mitochondrial genomics um, basically uh, has um, limited numbers of taxa for this group. Um, also, um, many people consider the mitochondrial genome to be a single linkage group, and so the, the genes within the mitochondrial genome are not considered independent sources of data. So comparing that to the phylogenomic data sets that are based on transcriptomes and uh, some of these other methods like anchor type enrichment, um, there's just a single linkage group in a mitochondrial genome. 
and whereas these other methods include genes from many different chromosomes throughout the genome. Okay, so many of you probably are familiar with this um, <clears throat> paper by Misop et al. from 2014. And this is basically used transcriptomics to look at the relationships among major lineages of insects. We have um, the Hemiptera represented here by representatives of all the, I, I can't seem to make my slides stay on one slide here, sorry. So there's all the um, suborders of Hemiptera that are represented in this, this data set, but um, only three, Akinorinka, were included. Um, Akinorinka were recovered as sister to Polyrinka in this analysis, which was kind of a surprising result. I don't think this had been found in any recent or any other phylogenetic study up to that point. Um, but obviously the taxon sample was much too small to tell us really anything about relationships within Akinorinka itself. So uh, my colleague at the Natural History Survey, Kevin Johnson and I, put together this uh, more detailed data set of, of uh, the hemiptera orders, which includes the hemiptera, um, in the strict sense, as well as the uh, Socodia and the Dysonoptera. And we included 34 Akinorinka within this data set. And these, uh, we also recovered the um, Akinorinka as monophyletic and sister to Coleorinka. sort of confirming the results of, of uh, MESOP at all in terms of the relationships among the suborders of Hemetra. So as part of the same study, my student, Rachel, Rachel Skinner, did a much more detailed transcriptome-based analysis of Arkinorinka, and we included 84 attacks of representing uh, all of the major lineages of this particular suborder of, of Hemetra. Um, more than 2,000 orthologous genes, and we recovered cicadomorpha sister to folgoromorpha. Relationships among the cicadomorpha superfamilies were a little bit unstable among different analyses within this study. Um, so, for example, the, the tree in the middle has uh, the cercopoidea sister to the cadoidea, and in the tree on the left, which I can't see, I don't know why this keeps happening here. And the tree on the left has, has circumpoidea and green sister to the membercoidea in purple. So um, the tree on the far right there is a more detailed analysis that Rachel did that was part of her dissertation. It was not published as part of the 2018 paper in systematic entomology. And that paper includes uh, a number of additional uh, taxa that were not included in her original analysis. And these were from uh, some genomes, some whole genomes that we sequenced for some taxa that we did not have RNA for, so, so we were able to fill in some caps in the taxon sample with some, um, with some additional folkloric families as well as some additional subfamilies of leafhoppers that we didn't have in the original analyses. So I'll come back to that um, more detailed tree a little bit later because I want to show you some of the details within the folkloromorpha. Okay, so one of the things that can cause problems for phylogenomic analyses of these massive sequence data sets is that you have to be really careful and check to make sure there's not systematic bias in the data. And what Rachel found in this particular study is that there actually is systematic bias in the nucleotide uh, composition of third codon positions. So this this uh, just is a plot of GC content across all the taxa in the data set in third codon positions. 
and the different um, super families are indicated by different colors here. And so um, you can see here in the purple, the Memorcoia have relatively high GC content, and the uh, circoids have, <laughs> this is crazy, I can't, this thing is like a hair trigger. So the, yeah, so the circopoids in yellow and this, or in uh, green and, this, and the cicadoids in yellow have relatively intermediate levels of DC in the third kind of composition, and fulcroids tend to have much lower levels of, of DC. So the way that Rachel was able to correct for this, at least partially, was by using degeneracy coded bases in the third code on position. And this, uh, this kind of removes that, that bias mostly. And so that, that can kind of um, account for the difference in these two trees here between the positions of the different uh, infra orders, or, um, super families of um, decayed morpha. Okay, so um, then we also tried to do uh, some additional analyses looking at more details within the Bakanarenka, particular lineages. And the first one we did using anchored hybrid technology, which uh, again allows us to use material that's preserved in ethanol instead of fresh or uh, frozen, was so we looked at. The relationships of Mamacoidia, we had 143 taxa in this data set representing all the subfamilies of Mamacoidia. And the different groups are indicated, the different groups that are recognized in the current classification are indicated by different colors here. Um, we found that the tree hoppers are Derived from the, the leaf hoppers, and we are already kind of knew that from previous phylogenetic studies based on morphology as well as uh, Sanger sequence data. But we didn't know what the what the sub what the sister group within the cicadellids was uh, to the tree hoppers, and what we found in this analysis was that there's these two subfamilies of leaf hoppers, Eulopini and Megathelmini, indicated here. In in purple and blue that are sister to the to the tree hop lineage. So that, that was kind of a new result for this particular study is we, we finally identified the sister group within the leaf hoppers to, to the tree hoppers. But another problem with this this paper with this particular study was we had all these deep um, branches that were very short that separate these different subfamilies of leaf hoppers, and um, that caused problems for resolving relation relationships among leaf hopper subfamilies. So, um, as you can kind of see here, some of these branches are very short. They had bootstrap values that were less than 100%, and um, depending on the Policies, these relationships um, were, were different. And so even though we kind of resolved the relationship of the tree hoppers to, to these two leaf hopper subfamilies that are kind of like tree hoppers in, in some morphological traits, um, the relationships between the rest of the leaf hopper subfamilies were not well resolved by this analysis. So this is the time tree from that same analysis with the um, calibration points, fossil calibrations indicated by the little red dots and the different branches. And so what we what this shows is that there were a lot of major lineages of leaf hoppers and tree hoppers that arose at about the same time in the Cretaceous. And when you get these kind of explosive rapid radiations in deep time, this, this is often going to result in uh, difficulties in resolving relationships among those major lineages. And so that, that's what we see here in this group. So one other, now, one other interesting result from this uh, study was that we also did a coalescent gene tree analysis of the same data. Now the, the 
results of presented so far have been based on concatenated data where you basically take all the genes and you line them up and you analyze them all together. This kind of analysis actually requires you to first produce gene trees for each individual gene in your data set. And in this case, we had almost 400 different genes. And so we produced a, a separate phylogeny for each of those genes. And then we combined those into a consensus tree. And we used the, the proportion of genes that, that support a particular branch on the tree as a measure of the support for that branch. And we did this for this data set we found that a lot of the, we had the same problem, a lot of the deep internal branches were very short, weren't well supported, but there were two main lineages of member coitia that we recovered consistently with high support. One of them was this group at the top, which is the tree hoppers plus megathelminae and those, those two tree hopper like leaf hopper subfamilies. And then at the bottom, we have the leafhopper, the rest of the leafhopper subfamilies. And so what this did was it gives us an opportunity to fix the problem of the paraphyly of cyclodelphy simply by removing these two tree hopper like leafhopper subfamilies and making them separate families. And then we can redefine cyclodelphy to include the rest of the leafhoppers in this bottom clay. Now, interestingly enough, um, Bo et al. in 2022 actually did another more detailed transcriptome-based analysis of memorcoidia, and they got exactly the same result as we got with our anchored hybrid data. Basically, these two main lineages of leafhoppers and treehoppers, with the leafhopper like treehoppers plus the treehoppers in the top, lineage and then the, the rest of the leaf hoppers in the bottom. So this I think was was really compelling evidence that this was actually a real result. We had two separate data sets, different saxon samples that basically gave us the same result using this coalescent gene tree approach. Okay, so we've also done more recently some more detailed analyses of individual subfamilies of leafhoppers using the anchor hybrid approach again. This is our biggest data set so far. This was for the Delta Cephalini, which is the largest leafhopper subfamily. This data set had 730 tax, and I think this is probably the biggest phylogenomic data set ever produced up to that time for a non-bacterial group of taxa. 650 anchor type loci. This gave us a really well-resolved result for this group. And um, basically uh, what we found was that most of the tribes that are currently recognized based on morphology are monophyletic but there's some larger tribes that we all already kind of knew were not well characterized by morphology that are not monophyletic in this, this result. One of these is Aphosanini, this group, which comes out in different parts of the tree. Another one is Scaphoidini, which, is, which also comes out in different, different parts of the tree. But I'll talk about this little in a little more in detail later, but this, um, this tree also includes some big lineages that include multiple tribes that are either restricted to particular biogeographic regions or to particular host plants. So all these groups down at the bottom of the tree are grass specialists. So there was a big plate of grass specialist leafhoppers that, that we recovered. Um, these, are, these are highly morphologically divergent. We didn't necessarily think they were all related to each other, but they are. They, they were recovered as a monophyletic group, and they all share this propensity to feed on grasses. There's another clay up near the top of the tree here. Um, I can get my slides to quit moving to the next one. So this, this includes the, the endemic New World tribes, Penderini, Bahatini, and Scapatopini. 
and this is a strictly New World associated play. Um, but it also includes a lot of Atlas and Eni that are restricted to the New World, as well as some representatives that have been placed in other tribes. So that was kind of interesting. This is our um, separate study of Typha Sabini, which is the other big leaf upper subfamily. This is a time tree for that group. We recovered uh, five of the previously recognized tribes um, as monophyletic. We also recovered support for a new tribe, Imarani, this, this small branch there in between Tiflispini and Nipurnurini that's restricted to the new world. Um, but we also noticed an interesting pattern in, in this uh, tree, this time tree. There are three different groups of new and old world pairs of sister groups in this tree indicated by the red arrows there. And in each case, the new world sister is much less diverse than its old world counterpart. And I'll come back to that in a minute as a potential explanation for that. We've also looked at tree hoppers, also using anchor tiger data. This is a tree that was uh, part of a PhD dissertation from Micah Fletcher, who was looking at the evolution of ant mutualism and pre-social behavior in tree hoppers. Um, this is also the time tree from that, that study. And one of the interesting things was that the tree hoppers are grouped mostly in these two sister groups. The membracid tree hoppers are two, two sister groups. And then um, the Tree hoppers had two different colonizations of the old world. Um, they originated in the new world, but then they colonized the old world twice, once in the Italianity during the Cretaceous, and a separate time during the Paleogene in um, the Central Tiny. Okay, um, just looking quickly at the, the fulcromorphin part of Rachel Skinner's um, analysis that she did as part of her PhD based on transcriptomes. This is uh, the part of the tree that I was mentioning earlier that um, includes all of the families of, all the currently recognized families of, of uh, extant Fogromorpha except for a couple of small ones like Gangity and Hypothamility. But no, no big surprises here. These are, this uh, tree mostly agrees with the recent analyses based on smaller amounts of sequence data. Um, the, all the branches on this tree that don't have any uh, numbers or dots are supported with 100% bootstrap. So these are, this is the Delpha, Delpha Coidia, the Sixiates and Delphacids. We've got the the um, Minophids and Canarids together, so stick to the rest of the Fulcroidia. We've got the Achalyxiids here on a separate branch rather than together with Achalyxi. We've got um, Fulcroids, sister to the Gifferas, not, not no surprise there. One of the interesting things about this tree is that um, Tetagometrids are sister to Calisalids, and I don't think that's been found in any other analysis. Um, and then these branches near the bottom that are very short and have dots on them are the ones that, that were kind of unstable among different analyses of this data set. And these pertain to relationships among the higher fulcral rates. And that's something that's kind of been a problem for other recent analyses of this group. So cicadas also have been looked at. This was, a, this was one, one of the uh, the only one of these uh, studies that I wasn't personally involved with, so I'm not going to say too much about it, but basically this was also based on anchor tiger data, and it pretty much recovered the existing classification of cicada, the cadoidia. So, um, yeah, I think that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, so what have we learned? I'm going to try to summarize this real quickly here. So, first, Akinrinka are monophyletic, at least the extent Akinrinka well-supported monophyletic group. Also, really 
strong support for the sister relationship between Polyarenka and Akinarenka. And so this is this is the basic phylogeny of the mitra here. We got Sternarenka, six sister to Heteroptera plus Akinarenka plus Polyarenka. Akinarenka is sister to Polyarenka, together sister to Heteroptera. Now I realize that um, Yasek this morning uh, would dispute this based on the fossil record, I will point out that this this will this does not require horizontal transfer of salsia between Fulcromorpha and Cicadomorpha. So you can kind of decide which, which one of us you believe in terms of uh, which, which one is more functional. Okay, another thing we've learned is that relationships that are poorly resolved by morphology and Sanger sequence data also often remain poorly resolved by phylogenomic analyses. And examples of these include the sister group relationships among the three superfamilies of Cicadomorpha, and status relationships of higher fulcroid families, and relationships among cicadelid subfamilies. These are still unresolved. They, they've been a problem for a long time. And it seems that even with massive amounts of sequence data, we're going to have trouble resolving these relationships. Another thing we found is that morphological characters are generally informative. Um, and so things that are well supported by morphology, groups that have been recognized in the classification for a long time, tend to be supported by um, phylogenomic analysis. And an example of this is basically our, our study of Typhlosabini. Most of the tribes have been recognized by high wing vein characters, some of which are shown at the bottom here. We plotted the uh, evolution of these different characters on the tree and find that most of those characters are pretty stable. There, there are some exceptions, like the, the character that was traditionally used to, to, uh, to diagnose the Zika and Lini tribe. Um, that, that particular character has arisen multiple times. So another thing we found is that major lineages have often diversified within particular biogeographic regions around single host plants. And I mentioned this big clade of delta cephalines that was recovered in our um, anal analysis of, of the delta cephaline. And this, this is the clade here. It basically includes these three endemic New World tribes but it also includes endemic New World genera belonging to Aphis and Eni, as well as some other, uh, some other uh, subfamilies. There's other groups of other big clades of Delta Sep lines that are also supported. Data sets for individual subfamilies is that we have this interesting pattern of disparities between, in diversity, between new and old world sister group pairs. So these are lineage through time plots, basically with the number of lineages indicated on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. We see there's this inflection point at about uh, 60 to 70 million years ago, wherein the, the old world lineages indicated by the gray line increase at a much quicker rate, right, than the new world lineages that are sister to those old world lineages indicated in orange. What we think this might be is a, a signature of a disproportionate impact on the new world fauna by the end Cretaceous extinction event. So um, it would be interesting to look at other groups and see if similar patterns are found. But so far, we, we've just looked at these particular two groups. And these are, these are only evident because we had these, these very densely sampled data sets where we had taxes. Uh, sampled from throughout the ranges of these, these two subfamilies. Okay, so finally, this is my last slide here. So basically, phylogenomic studies of Akinrenka have done really recently and so far included only a small fraction of the known diversity. We still need uh, more comprehensive studies of a lot of groups, including Vulgromorpha, Cicadoidea, and Cercopoidea, as well as more detailed studies of individual lineages within individual families. 
we found that analyses of large data sets with balanced samples across higher taxa and regions are needed to, to elucidate recurrent global patterns that may reveal major factors that are responsible for generating the high diversity of the group and explaining discrepancies in diversity among the region plays. And I just want to end by saying that we uh, do have ongoing analyses um, based on Amber Tiger data. Um, my colleague, Zhao uh, Yanghui, will be presenting some of her most recent results later this week. So stay tuned. But we also are very interested in, in collaborating with people that are interested in other groups of Lock and Rinka. So if you, if you would like to try to do some of these kind of analyses using genomic scale data sets, um, come talk to me and we'll, we'll see what we can do. But yeah, that, so thanks a lot. Um, I would like to acknowledge my, my collaborator, Zhao Yanghui, who did most of the analyses that I presented here today. And I want to thank a lot of you in this room, other collaborators who really helped us with, with getting specimens relevant to these studies and um, getting permission to, to do field work. So, thanks. Anything to Dr. Dietrich?